Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 79. This episode is Alex Ray, who's awesome. He's just the best, man. He is uh, the artist for a Star Wars comic, which if you're listening to this, you've most likely read it and know how amazing it is. And if you haven't, go read it. It's amazing. But uh, Alex and I, we uh, we talked about all kinds of stuff. It's really cool talking to an artist um, because every artist is different and everyone has their own sort of process. And he, I haven't been able to uh, to to identify his style because he's done so many things. He's just very well versed uh, as an artist and just a super fun dude to talk to. I feel like we really hit it off. Uh, but we talk about coding, which is something he's recently gotten into, and I have no idea what that means. Well, I kind of do now because he explained it. But we talk about that. We talk about how he uh, got into art, like where he started drawing, going to school, different mediums, uh, things that he likes, things that he definitely doesn't. Um, and then we dive into caricature because he's he's really, really good at it. And caricature is such a specific art form that I'm just fascinated by the, the process and how to get that specific look. Um, so we go into that and then... Uh, we talk about a Star Wars comic, which, as I said before, is so good. Check it out. It's really, really well done. And honestly, in my opinion, it it holds up with the canon stuff. It really does. Like, if you didn't know this was a fan-made comic, honestly, I don't think I don't think you'd realize it. I think you'd think this is just another one that uh, Disney and Marvel and all those guys are putting out because it's that good. Uh, so let's get into it. Let's... Uh, Get get over me talking, and let's get into the interesting podcast, episode number 79, with Alex Ray. Theme song time. Not too bad, not too bad. How's your day going? All right, just coding away here. Yeah, yeah. I think I, I think I read that. Coding for fun. Well done. <laughs> yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to get a job in it. Yeah. Some, yeah I'm moving How, out. What exactly is coding? Because I have <laughs> no idea. Like in theory, I do, <laughs> but not really. <laughs> you, uh, you learn. A version of English that computers can understand. That's basically. Oh, okay, okay. You just just uh, you just typey type things in a, a logical order, I guess. That are instructions that a computer can follow, and they're really really stupid. It takes <laughs> it takes so much explaining. Let me tell you. I bet. I bet. Is there different types of coding? Or is like coding a general? Yeah, I mean, I mean, in in general, it's all just problem solving. But there's lots of different ways to do it. There's lots of uh, there's lots of different quote unquote languages. Um, everybody thinks they have a better way to do it, so they just make a new one, and they're like, "This will be the best way." <laughs> so there's a hundred of them out there, and um, yeah, I guess I mean, there's different fields within it. There's you could do web stuff, you know, making websites or web apps, and then there's you know phone applications kind of mobile stuff then there's cyber security there's a whole bunch I mean, it's a huge huge field there's so many little sectors within it but i've been practicing doing that for a few years trying to trying to get a job besides art to hey. like pay the bills more yeah. than, than art has been i hear you yeah i've been working on disney books and things as well disney kids books and hey right on right on i think i remember uh ahmed best has a has a show called the afro futurist podcast and he was talking about how uh, a lot of people believe that coding is going to be like the new blue collar job, like yeah, in the future. Yeah, uh, I, I totally see that for sure. Yeah. I mean, they're, they teach it in schools now. I mean, Do they elementary. really? Yeah, elementary school kids get they what? get like basic. Yeah, man, they get like basic coding classes where it, it's done using uh, Scratch, which is like kind of visual. You know, sure. you get like you get little. Um, little icons and stuff you can link together and it's like here's a program but yeah i've seen that kids are using it now in schools what that's nuts 
I know, it's, and it's required. That's what's weird, because it's always been there, I guess, you know, since we were in high school and stuff, but now it's required. They have a class. Wow. Very strange. How about you? How's your day? Not too bad. Not too bad. I had no idea they did coding in schools now. I mean, I guess it makes sense, because, like, maybe five or six years ago, they stopped teaching cursive. <laughs> yeah. No. So you're like, we're it's... we're at the dawn of a new age. Yeah, nobody needs to know that anymore. My handwriting has suffered. It yeah. still works. It still works. It still comes out. It's just not. It's not as pretty as it used to be. Yeah, mine's <laughs> always been ineligible. I hold yeah. the I hold the pen weird. I have this thing where, like, in kindergarten, where they show you how to do that, you know, in between your thumb, your pointer, and your middle finger. I was <laughs> like, mm, I like to hold it this way. And, yeah. <laughs> and then first grade, they're like, here's one of those things. It's like a pencil grip. And I was like, you're just making it more uncomfortable for me to hold it my way. And it just never, <laughs> just never hold stopped. It with, hold it with your right hand. Yeah, it's hold. like a weird sort of, I use all four fingers and then my thumb to, I don't recommend it. <laughs> yeah. I, yeah, I've seen people hold hold writing utensils in such weird ways. It's like, sometimes it's like they're holding a dagger. Yeah. Or they're, they're hunched, they're curving their, their hook hand all the way around. That's right, that's right. That's pretty I've, funny. I've, I've started to notice some tightness in my, my carpals from doing all the drawing I've done. My wife yeah. smiles at me. She's been making fun of me for being 30 now. Yeah. Like, welcome, welcome to the oldies. Welcome yeah, to the exactly. <laughs> it's all downhill yeah, but, after 25, I hear. Isn't it? Yeah, 30. It's seriously. She was like, you watch. It's it's immediately going to – everything stops. Yeah. And, I was like, <laughs> and then my my belly is growing, and then we just went on a canoe trip with uh, her sister, like, for a camping thing, and, and I, like, did something to my shoulder. Now that hurts. I'm like, why? What? <laughs> I did nothing differently than I used to do. What is going on? <laughs> yeah. It's falling apart. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm yeah, I mean, all this, all this drawing, like, I realized I need to be, I need to hold it different, hold the pen different, because I have a, a wake on the Cintiq, you know, that I do all the, all my art on. It's a digital, the tablet. Yeah, yeah. And, and it slides around weird. There's not really any grip. I, I haven't, I haven't looked into getting the, they have, like, screen protector covers that add kind of the feeling of paper, stuff like that, to oh. your tablet. Because it's just plastic nib on plastic screen, so it just slides around. Sure. And maybe maybe that's contributing because it's starting to hurt. I'm gonna like I've been stretching my my arm out a lot. <laughs> you have too much that freedom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The the unseen dangers of art. Yeah, never exactly. Talk, nobody talks about carpal tunnel. <laughs> yeah, this is stuff they don't tell you about it. <laughs> like, be creative. It'll be fun. They said. <laughs> yeah. Do what you love. Yeah, exactly. That'll work out. <laughs> Oh my yeah, God. lately I've been lately I've been talking to people and they you know they say do what you love and it's I don't know it works for some people it seems like that's everyone's goals they want to do what they love to do and what you love to do when you're a kid you know is just dream about stuff true and yeah and it's so you want to be like a veterinarian or an astronaut not knowing the exact work that goes into it and the people who maintain and hold on to that end up be go, going into whatever field it is you know totally. uh, but once you get to a point where like, for instance, art with me, I've gotten kind of uh, disenchanted with the, like trying to make money at it. Cause it sure. takes so much, it takes so much self promotion. Like you see a lot of pretty successful people doing Kickstarters, Patreons. It takes so much effort to promote yourself. You're just oh, selling yourself yes. all that, you know, oh, <laughs> you know, God, it's the worst. <laughs> yeah. So, so it's like, well, I do love to do it. I do love drawing and making stuff, you know, but the rest gets in the way. So, I've changed my mantra to do something you can tolerate <laughs> and do, 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 it, do something you love on the side. <laughs> That's the 30 your, year old speaking. Yeah, dude, for real. <laughs> keep yourself from going absolutely insane. Yeah. <laughs> Pass the time somehow. <laughs> yeah, and that's that's kind of why I've been doing the whole coding thing I was talking about. I just, I mean, programming and 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 learning learning about computers. I, for some, I built I built my computer to do, to make art on, and then I was like, huh, how's, how do all these how do all these pieces work? And then I figured out just it, it just engages me, you know, like it, if it intrigues you and you enjoy like you know, for me it would be problem solving and and learning all the little ins and outs of, of how all of that works. And it's still very fascinating to me, you know, sure. and it, it helps inform a lot of stuff, especially in life. And it's like very, everything's digital now, you know, 100%. it seems, seems useful. Whereas art is still beautiful and amazing. And I love doing it, but you know, I, you sit there and you measure yourself against all those people on Instagram and Twitter. Oh yeah. It's like, and a lot of times it just comes down to who's better at promoting, especially nowadays, you know, uh -huh. Yeah, I'm sure you feel that with your podcast, trying to get the uh, word out. 
my God. I, I'm, I'm Savannah. <laughs> Savannah, my co-host on the Dorky Diva Show, she's gotten me better at it uh, because I would like post once about it. And I'm like, hey, here's the new show. Here's what's going on. Uh, and then I wouldn't post again because I'm like, God, I'm like beating it to death and everyone's hearing about it. And Oh, God, I don't want to keep being like, hey, had a show yesterday uh, and, and two days ago if you didn't catch it. I'm like, oh, and man. That, that's the worst thing is the algorithm. You have to like push it, push it, push it, push it. You know, exactly. you're competing. You're competing with Russian bots. I Ryan. know. I've already lost. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're tireless yeah. and, and Russian. The so. enemy does not eat. They do not it's, sleep. <laughs> yeah, dude. They just feed their bots nothing but vodka and then they yeah. go. With <laughs> My nightmares are just full of nine. <laughs> Yeah, oh you know, actually, I was listening. I would listen to uh, another podcast um, about you know ha- hacking and, and breaches and stuff like that. And the guy was talking about how Apple Podcasts did. Like someone figured out it was actually a, a group of Bangladeshi. Um, I don't know if you want to call them criminals. I guess they're just you know hackers, or whatever. I'm not really sure. Yeah. <laughs> but they, they figured out how to game the Apple Podcast. You know, uh, top hundred. Yeah, and it wasn't even it wasn't even like you know. Um, repeat you know make bots that just repeatedly up you know re- write fake reviews and and get, add five stars it was legitimately just getting a bunch of apple accounts you know 50 to 100 apple accounts that, yeah. that these guys would get and they would just download all the episodes of a podcast and that would superficially oh. push them up and you know that on apple podcast that front page of you know whatever is trending i forget what it's called but yeah. that page that's where you want to be and uh, and they were there in the podcast. He was equating it to um, uh, the the New York Times bestseller list. Like you can kind of pay to win, but it was just it was so much easier. It wasn't even just pay to get reviews. It was literally just get some people with some fake or you know they were legitimate accounts, but just a bunch of them to just download all of this of your podcast over the course of a couple of weeks, and you would just float up there in the top what? fifty. I know, right? And you're like, that's kind of genius. <laughs> Yeah, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> in, yeah. in the most seedy way possible. It is. I mean, whatever. It's kind of like, it's not cheating if if it's... <laughs> I mean, they figured it out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Is it cheating if it's if it's a part of the system? I That's don't know. Right. I knew a guy one time back when, like, when YouTube <coughs> first started their, uh, their AdSense program, where it was, mm-hmm. like, buy views, and then if the views went up, you made more money. And he just had, like, 50 tabs open that would auto-refresh every, like, minute or so. And he made so much money off that until YouTube's like, wait a second. When do you realize what's happening here? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, that's dude, that'd be a super there's some there's some people who get really into that lucrative like bug bug bounties. Have you heard of those? No, what is that? So um it, companies say like, you know, Facebook, Amazon, whoever, they will they'll have a bug bounty. Uh I mean the CIA does it every once in a while. They'll be like, Hey, see if you can hack our website. It's like an open call Ooh, to hackers. That's so cool. If you find, and a lot of times it'll just be an an open standing bug bounty, right? And the the payout ranges from you know a couple hundred bucks, five hundred bucks to like you know fifty thousand or more dollars. Jeez. Because what they want is for oh hey I found this vulnerability in your application, um, and instead of going and selling it on the dark web to whatever malicious actors, they would you know disclose it to the company. Sure. And they're like, thanks for letting us patch this hole. Here's a bundle, you know, a bucket of money. <laughs> Ooh, that's smart. Yeah, so people, um, so yeah, there's a lot of them that have this outstanding. And there's, I was just uh, reading, forget where, but he's like a teenager in in Central or South America. Like has has he, could, he has a Porsche, you know, he bought his, <laughs> like hacker that that found, you know, all he does is spend his day. That people make a job out of. You just sit there and and like you know throw, basically just just shoot a flamethrower at the at the website that you're trying to hack just try everything try the book and if something works and they haven't found it yet you tell them about it and they pay you money wow what a way what it's a, a way wild to make west money. It's the wild west on the internet brian yeah, yeah it is <laughs> <laughs> i will pay you to try to break into my bank mm-hmm. uh, all right you're telling me i can do a criminal activity and get paid for it done mm-hmm. Well, it's called it's like gray gray hat there. Um, so I'm talking a lot about this hacking stuff, man. It's just been that's that, what I've been that's talking what the, about. That's what the show's about. Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't talked at all about Star Wars or art or anything. But. Oh, dude, you think I have a plan with these things? <laughs> <laughs> Somewhere. Here yeah, we'll we'll find the thread eventually. I I am fascinated by this because I've I've had no idea this went. 
I will yeah. say to be called a, a bug bounty hunter is very Starship Troopers, and I'm into it. <laughs> Isn't it? Do your part. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's a tip today. I caught yeah. three bugs this year. Check out my Porsche because of it. All right, <laughs> respect, man, respect. Yeah, that's they call them. Uh, they call them gray hats. That the those guys. There's like white hat, black hat, red. I guess red hats not really paying. Right? Yeah, white, <laughs> black, white, black, and gray. So white hat hackers would be ethical hackers, uh, which oh. are people who they work for cybersecurity companies that are like consultants that get paid to go in. You know, companies like, hey, come and break into our stuff. Tell us how you did it. You know, give us a report. Where are we vulnerable? So those guys are white hat hackers, and they get a written consent. You know, it's very legal by the books to go do this. Black hat hackers would that are just pure black are just people that exploit stuff. You know, they're the sure. they're the they're people who live on the dark web that get hired to to go break into a, a bank and steal all the account numbers or you know user passwords or whatever, right. and they do it. Cre- and then there's the gray people that are the ones I was talking about. You kind of like, yeah, technically you don't have permission and you're doing something that's very illegal, yeah. but <laughs> the company is happy to have you tell them about it. You're, you're, uh, what is it? Chaotic. Good. Yes. You're chaotic. Good. That's right. <laughs> oh, dude. You use yeah, the right you. term. <laughs> it literally yeah. is the old West out there. Know, White man. hats and black hats and gray hats. <laughs> it's like, you've got the rooster Cogburns of the marshals. Yes. Know. Hey, speaking of that, have you seen? Um, we didn't finish watching the last story, but Buster Scruggs. Oh Buster... yes, dude! <laughs> what a yeah. ride! So good. I was, I was talking. My wife was like, "We we turn it on because our friends like we should just watch this." And uh, we we turn it on, and she's like, "Did the Cohn brothers make this? We had no idea." Oh yeah, oh yeah. Call it so good, man. It really is. Yeah, <laughs> uh, my wife and I weren't expecting an anthology right away, so they're like, "Wait, so how does this one connect with this?" Oh, it doesn't. Got it. And it's just yeah. so good. Yeah, that's their, all their goofy musical numbers. Yeah, and yeah. <laughs> everything Code Brothers. Oh God, we gotta finish watching that. There's so many shows now. Oh, man. tell me about it. It's, it's like, like we just finished The Office for the first time. Oh yeah. And we're like, all right, cool, we did that. Now what? And there's like what? 50 other things. It's it's a lot. Excuse me, Brian. When was the last time you read a book? Whether or not it was listening to it or... Uh, okay, okay. Well, I have to say that I am predisposed to audiobooks because mm-hmm. I deliver newspapers <laughs> for a living. Oh, really? I, yeah, I do a, like big bulk orders to stores. So I don't get to do like the fun bags out the windows at houses. I do like... Oh, man. <laughs> I know, right? Hitting, I, hitting old guys in the head. I, the I always man. thought if I did that, I'd want to try and invent something that was like a t-shirt cannon. You know, just, thunk, thunk, yeah, portable, thunk, thunk. portable t-shirt can. It'd be Perfect. the best. But so, so I've been doing that for a very long time, and uh, so I have like two to three hours alone in a car to myself, which yeah. is perfect for podcasts and perfect for audiobooks. So yeah, that's I'm I'm, I'm, I'm I'm with you, man. I, I was because I was thinking that uh, about uh, listening to to whatever content uh-huh. rather. Rather than sitting, having to hold the book in your hands or an e-reader. E-readers are great for, for planes and stuff, too. Yes, you know? yes, yes. But if you got to do something with your hands, you know, and they've done, I can't remember where, but, you know, there's a study for everything. And then there's some study that comes out to refute the previous study. But yeah, of course. You showed, they did some, somebody did with a control group of people. They were like, here, you read the actual book, you know, read the text, whether it was an e-reader or a paper printed book. Mm-hmm. And then have these people listen. And there was no change in comprehension. You I know. bet. I bet. At all, because it's just you're still listening to the words. You're still having to. But the great thing is, you get to because you, you're turning your brain off. Because what you, you're just driving, right? You just drive. Exactly. And... Same stops every night. I'm on autopilot, <laughs> which is yeah. you know dangerous. But hey, I'm listening to a good book <laughs> while I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's great, man. That's cool. But I um, I listen to a lot of audiobooks. I guess. Do you have you chew through them? I bet. Especially yeah. With that. Yeah. Pretty pretty quickly because I like Queen Shadow just came out. And I was like, oh, well, it's Catherine Tabor reading a Padme book. I got I to gotta do this. So it took like three nights, and it was done. <laughs> cool. I have, not, I have not kept up with the um, the books that have been coming out. It's a lot, It's a, especially like maybe two years ago because it was like nine or ten books that came out in a year. And I, I bought Thrawn, and I still have to, have to read it. <laughs> Thrawn's a tough one. Thrawn. Yeah. <laughs> a, lot of the, a lot of the new Thrawn books, specifically the first one, Mm-hmm. Uh, it's very slow for a while, <laughs> and then and then it's got really really good parts, and then it's like all right we're back to we're back to this, and then Alliances, which I think was the second one, that one's really good as well. 
Yeah, I know. I need to get on. I know Jim, Jim is so much better at keeping up with the uh, with the current sequel stuff. Just you know, the sequel era we are in now. Sure. Uh, he's better at keeping up with all the new canon and and everything. He he sometimes he'll give me sort of cliff notes or just like it's good, man. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's my understanding of 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 some of it now. And you're like, all right, cool. Just checking. Got to make sure we're still up to par. Yeah, that's man. Uh, mostly so, when I get it, mostly I end up. Oh yeah, sorry. Go ahead. I was just gonna ask, are you are you in Orlando? Yeah. Are you from Orlando? No, well, yeah. I mean, I was born in in Fort Myers, but you know, what? Moved, yeah, I, was, I moved here when I was like three. So, dude, I live in Naples. Oh yeah. <laughs> Fort Myers. Yeah, my, hey. Yeah, my my parents moved away from there when I was uh, three or so, because back then Fort Myers is now getting you know whatever gentrified, and there's there's a there's more of a younger hip population that's there. Mm -hmm. Um, but generally, the coast of Florida is a lot of retirees. And oh, that's Naples. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. The average age there was 60 or something. So they're like, we're yep. going we're, we're gonna to move where there's Disney. That's, though, a, that's a good idea. <laughs> though my parents, uh, genius, they did not – this is back when it was like, you know, it's Disney Springs. You, before that, it was downtown Disney and Pleasure Island. And then before that, it was the um, Disney Marketplace. It was just – Right. Just a Lego store and Fulton's Crab House or whatever. Um, back when it was just Disney Marketplace, my parents would take me and my little brother when he was you know old enough to Disney Marketplace, and we'd go to the Lego store, and they're like, "Welcome to this is Disney Disney World." Yeah, <laughs> well, it was, like, it's a Lego place. I had no idea. Yeah, perfect. It was free parking, no no ticket price that they had to pay. There so you for, go. I turned about ten or eleven, and my uncle came to town. Maybe, uh, maybe I was like nine, but my uncle came here with his kids from Michigan, and they took us to actual Magic Kingdom, and they're like, "What is this?" <laughs> My parents are like, great, now we have to pay for the tickets. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Genius, oh, though. Worked yeah. for a while. That's perfect. <laughs> but I don't remember what movie it was, but I remember seeing this movie a while ago where this guy like didn't have any money, and he's like, all right, let's go to the zoo. Let's go to the zoo. So he takes his daughter to like a pet store, and mm. he's like, oh, look, here's the fish, and oh, here's a ferret. Look at this. This is a zoo. So for forever, she thought like Pet Supermarket was, was <laughs> the, the zoo. zoo. Yeah. That's a zoo of sorts. Yeah, there's, there's animals, and you can touch those. You know, yeah. which I guess could lead to more problems later. Yeah. You think you can touch the animals. That's crazy, yeah. though. Anytime somebody knows anything near Southwest Florida, I'm like, oh, hey! <laughs> I, feel, I feel seen. <laughs> There's more of us here than the media. Like, I feel like general media gets credit because a lot of things you see come out of, uh, you know, California or New York or Atlanta or whatever. But, like, Florida gets a bad rap, is all I'm saying. And there's I mean, a lot of. There's a lot of people and creatives that come from weird old Florida. That's true. I mean, we have no choice, you know. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't choose this life. <laughs> exactly. Florida uh, um, man is a creative in his own right. He just went well, down the wrong road. Yes, you know? very. Yeah, I, I feel. See, Florida man is is bath salts and and uh, you know net <laughs> assaulting yeah. animals. Yeah. And then and then there's his. I feel like there's his his honorable brother, Florida guy. There's yeah. Florida guy as well. <laughs> He's he's the one who's who's cleaning up trash and trying you know uh, That's he's right. he's lobbying the, for the Everglades yeah. <laughs> Florida guy. He's the unofficial <laughs> Florida man. He he's the one that's like there's a lot of sun here, maybe solar panels, I don't know. And maybe then Florida man's sun. like eating the corner of one. Mm -hmm. like, yeah. <laughs> I, I always think of do you ever watch Atlanta? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. oh dude. Yeah, the, so good. The the second season episode of it's called uh, Alligator Man. And they had this yes. whole bit about Florida Man. Yeah, he's and, like, I think Florida Man is, he's, he's really a guy, like he, Darius, he makes that yeah. whole. <laughs> he's right? like, he's name. the Johnny Appleseed of crime. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he makes it up. He's like, no, it's not a conspiracy. He's just a, <laughs> the real person. And it's all the one guy. <laughs> yeah, the legend is real. <laughs> yeah. Let's see. Florida Man beats a flamingo to death. You're like, what is happening? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's us. Oh my every, god! Every state has their own thing, but Florida definitely we have a lot of it. It's true. We just get the more creative headlines, I think. It's this is true. So, man, Central Florida is insane by, right now. By the way, um, we have had we have the like, I four runs through here. There our main oh, highway, yes. you know, Orlando, and it, they've been doing this reconstruction project on it for years because of the amount of tourism that comes for Disney and Universal, and. Let me, let me ask you, we saw this statistic, my wife and I were just curious, because we're like, why is it always so crazy? We're like, why? There can't be that many people that live here. Yeah. It can't be that many tourists. So the actual Orlando downtown area has a couple hundred thousand people, I think. And then the greater Orlando area, which is like surrounding suburbs, is about a million people, permanent residents, okay? 
It's a lot, but it's a big area. You true, know? true. Even including the people that live by and around Disney, Kissimmee, Hunter Street, all these areas that That's feed true. in. That's true. That's true. So how many visitors do you think they clocked for uh, 2017? Oh, God, I don't even know, especially with the way Disney is now. Yeah, well, take a guess. Just take a random guess. Let's see. I'm going to just ballpark it at double the population. Try 72 million people. Oh, mother yeah. of God. Yeah, so 72 million people, which is, you know, over uh, five, 5 million a month. That's like 6 million a month. Good that's, you know. Lord. Every month, that's how many people, and that's why I was like, oh, well, there you go. That explains I why get it's it so now. crazy. Should they, you know, the most dangerous road yeah. ever. <laughs> so many accidents and deaths and, and, like, just crazy people, at least in our experience driving. But it's just because there's so much tourism. And it's great. I mean, it pays everybody's bills, but they've also, I don't know, it doesn't, it's just getting too crazy for us. I and hear you. Central Florida area is nuts. So. I, Naples is doing the same thing. They're overbuilding <laughs> everywhere. Like anywhere there's a few trees, I'm like, give it a year, that'll be condos. <laughs> and they keep writing articles that are like, Naples, happiest place in the world to live. I was like, stop writing these. They keep coming here and they don't leave. I know. It's, just... it's also everyone knows it's Sweden. Come on. <laughs> it's true. It's true. It's not, it's not Naples. No, it's true. My God. <laughs> it's just and and the average age here is like they call it home of the newlywed and the nearly dead. <laughs> Except uh, there's no newlyweds anymore because no one can afford to live here. It's bonkers, man. Like I, I'm taking an acting class right now, mm -hmm. and uh, I have three other classmates, and they're all in their 60s. And I was like, huh. "All right, <laughs> we have a range here." Now too late. They, they get, you have lots of experience to draw from there. Exactly. Exactly. Life it's, experience. Exactly. Get their memoirs. Yeah. <laughs> Tell me your experience so I can take them and use them. Have you uh have you watched Barry? Speaking of acting classes. No, I've heard amazing things though. Yeah, we've we we've watched about I don't know half, half of the first season I guess. And there yeah, it's really I mean it's both good? both my both my wife and I love Bill Hader. Oh yeah. Oh, no, same. it's it's really well done and so funny. And they're short, man. They're like half an hour. It, it, you don't oh. have to feel you don't have to feel bad about oh yeah. I, I could never just, you know, enrich my brain with a book or, you know, go for a bike ride or a walk, but I'll yeah. sit here for 7 hours and watch it. <laughs> The, the length of three full length, you know, for Lord of the Rings. I'll sit here for the whole of the extended Lord of the Rings trilogy on DVD, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I will not go outside. No, but they're they're super good. I just he's, I mean, Bill Hader is so fun, and that show. There's just some really good characters. There's there's like a Chechenian mobsters. Oh, <laughs> and sweet. You've got an almost Borat accent of just like, oh come on now, dude. <laughs> oh, bro, that's not cool. No, you don't mean that. <laughs> It's oh really, but it's God. really well done, and and he's in an acting class. He's like trying to find himself, you know, instead of being a contract killer. He's, right. It's <laughs> such a good yeah. idea for a show. It is, man. Bill Hader is a uh, Bill Hader is very talented guy. Oh my God, and <laughs> I think Henry Winkler finally won for that show. Oh yeah, he's doing there. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. He no won, way. Uh, he won an Emmy, yeah. He deserves it. He does a good job as well, being himself. <laughs> yeah. God, he's the best. <laughs> Man, so you talked uh, about when you're. So, so I have this theory that mm -hmm. if, uh, like you're saying, as you're a kid, you have these ideas where you're dreaming, and then you you don't necessarily understand what those dreams actually entail. Mm -hmm. I have this theory that if you're a kid and you have this dream and it's stuck with you the entire time, it's almost like meant to be if you're willing to meet it halfway with the work ethic. Mm -hmm. So, like, did you? With your drawing, was that something that you came into later on or something you did as a kid? Oh, yeah, no, I, I always did. I always drew just pictures of me really little just with markers and stuff. I think it's weird. There's a lot about that, I could say, because... Uh, Good. Yeah, I, I, was about, I was about seven or eight, you know, when I started to really... And I've, it's really funny going back. My mom, of course, she kept all of these drawings, like everything. She finally got rid of them when they, they sold her house, old house, and moved out to their, their new place. Um, uh -huh. But she was like, do you want any of these? And I was just going through so much. Of that. I didn't even remember making most of it, you know. Um, and you can kind of see a progression uh, oh. coming up. But... I, when I was about nine years old, I remember, you know, I'd been, I just really liked drawing and I was like, I'm going to go to art school. I'm going to be a painter. Um, and so I did, and I stuck with that. Like I was kind of lucky because a lot of people you go, if you're going to go to college, you're going to do the four year degree thing. A lot of people end up going into psychology it, just to start, they pick a, they just pick a thing. You know, right. they're not sure what, what major, like they'll pick business or just something generic. And they're not sure if that's really the track they want because they're not sure. And I was always like, art, I'm going to do art. Um, 
so art kid all through high school, art kid into college. Um, and then I was like, oh, you can't really be a gallery painter <laughs> because it's, <laughs> it's very difficult to make your whole living that way. You're right. Um, so illustrator was kind of the in between there. But it takes a lot. It takes a lot of practice to do anything at all. Like you're in acting classes, right? You're getting better, I'm sure. For sure. Uh, but to become a master actor or anything, you have to just spend, sink so much time into it. So you do have to really love it to get, you know, mastery. What is it? Um, was it 10,000 ta- hours? Yeah, but yep. like ta- talent and affinity you yep. know, for something become mastery through like applied practice. That's you have to do it. Otherwise, you don't get better at it. And there's a lot of people I've met, you know, in my life that are, they just talk about, you know, oh, I, I brute, I brute force, you know, and I get to something, I just brute force through it. I just, I just figure it out, you know, but, sure. and they, they act like they've done a lot of things they act, but they don't, you know, you don't see their thousands of bad drawings. Yeah, it's true. Even, even all the pros, their work that I love on, on Instagram and Twitter, I just know that they go through the same thing. Where they, you know that they have like 500 terrible drawings or drawings that they've erased and re, you know, or crumpled up and thrown away, just like this was terrible. And then the ones that you see that make you give you imposter syndrome, like, yeah. oh my God, that would be that good. <laughs> the stuff you see, you know, you see, uh, oh man, what's his name? I pick an actor you love that's really good. <laughs> Some you see them acting or see someone doing something that's obvious. They make it look easy, and you don't see all the fumbles and foibles like along the way. It's true, very but, true. But yeah, I always, I always did want to do art, and then, yeah. And I mean, reality. you've kind of done pretty good, though. Yeah, I feel like it's gotten a lot better in the last couple of years, man. You should see some of these drawings. I still have <laughs> sitting, sitting in the desk by my, or sitting in this drawer by my desk of when Jim and I first started trying to make comics years ago. Like I met him six or seven years ago, God, and uh, <laughs> he was like, "You, you art? I write. I have words. You have the draw." And I was like, "Yeah, I do the draw." <laughs> So I, I have the draw. I have a pen. What have <laughs> you got? I was like, I have a pen too. Ooh, so, fight to the death. <laughs> <laughs> so he started writing this story and I started trying to draw it. And, you know, it was just a painstaking process trying to, to, to figure out how to panel a page and everything was like super, you know, I tried really hard to ink it properly. And, and I go back and look and they're so static and the proportions are so wrong and everything's terrible. And even now, you know, I go back two years ago to our first the Star Wars comic, and I look, and it's like, ugh. <laughs> they're good. There's, that's I think an artist. The, throughout, throughout the whole of that, of the of Star Wars comic, it, there's been some really good ones that both of us liked. There's been some ones that we argued over. <laughs> there's been some, some ones that <laughs> didn't because of they were rushed or whatever. But I go back and look, and it's just, man, there's always room for improvement. And uh, it's just a lot. <laughs> yeah, I bet. So it was... Do you, so you, when you're going to art school, having no context once again, uh, yeah. do they make you do like different mediums and different ways to do things? Like today we're doing markers, today we're doing paints. Like how exactly does that work? Oh, it's just an A for effort, you know. Oh, okay. and, they, <laughs> and they give you candy too, candy and a degree at the end. <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm rethinking this podcasting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Can't I get candy for how many thousands of what? dollars? I can kind of fumble my way through a stick figure. <laughs> yeah, they, um, Wait, what kind of candy? I had a I had a guy who was he was um oh it's it's all sugar sugar daddies. Sugar oh sweet, no, yeah, <laughs> that's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, this this guy asked he was like so I don't mean to sound you know disparaging but how do they you know grade you in art school <laughs> because he was a, he was an engineer and it's pretty clear that like if you get the prop you get the answer wrong right and to me art is communication there's some people i realized more that i was wrong over because i used to say it's all about communication you fail if you fail to communicate something to that person whether or not they bring some intrinsic understanding of your visual imagery or their own personal experience to it they always do you know it's the eye of the beholder like you make something the color red means something different to me than it does to you even right um but in the end you have to communicate something like you paint a, a, a parochial scene of like a cottage on a mountainside you know it's like hey that's a mountain with a cottage on it and then maybe that evokes some feeling in the in the person who's viewing it but what they do in art school is break all your bad habits of thinking like did they want to teach for me it was like you get out of it what you put into it what i wanted to get out of it was learn how to communicate visually with two-dimensional art so Mm. 
get to art school, you have all these terrible habits because you've been drawing on like, you know, small paper and you don't know anything about anything. And you have this idea of what a tree looks like in your head, you know, brown trunk, fluffy green thing on top of it. But you haven't sat down and actually looked at a tree and tried to replicate a tree. So they don't teach you how to draw or how to paint. They really teach you how to see. And then they teach you how to use different techniques and materials. Like we had to use a lot of oil paint. Um, so then you learn, you have to learn color theory, you have to learn form, composition, rhythm, all the, all the basics, all the foundational principles of art. And then they sit you down and they force you to do things in a certain way. Like one exercise was, um, that I've always loved is called blind contour, where you get a sheet of paper and whatever implement a marker, pencil, and then you set it up in your lap or on a table. And then you're looking, say at a person across from you, a classmate, and you have to um, draw them the contour line, which is the outer edge of their face or head or hair. You know, just you just draw a single continuous line without picking up your implement, your pencil, and you just Ooh. so you have to just follow the outlines of every part of their hairline, their ears, you know, all the little swirls in there, their eyelash or the, their eyebrows. You do all of that without ever picking up your pencil. And you don't get to look at the paper. Ooh, so it makes cool. – it is. And it always may. I mean once you practice at it a bit, it's a really cool effect. And, and you get better at it. And the whole point is training your hand to the, the fine motor control and the muscles of your elbow and your hand to follow exactly what your eye is seeing. Because you're learning how to see what's actually in front of you and then replicate it. So you learn just like how you learn grammar – before you start writing like Hemingway or I don't know, you, you, before you develop a writing style, you have to learn all the rules so you can break them. Sure, sure. Same thing with art. You have to do, I mean, people are always like, oh man, I wish I could draw. I was like, well, when was the last time you sat down and you drew a fire hydrant? You just sat in front of your mom or, you know, your dog and tried to draw what you see and not just like out of your head, be like, I want to draw a thing and just doodle it. Like you have to practice from life. You have to. Uh, some people make a living off of like really strange, weird drawings, but I feel like the best, the best art, the best work that comes out are people who have spent the time, you know, drawing from life in, in some way, like eventually it changes. Eventually you can do whatever you want, but if you've, if you've taken that time to go to figure drawing classes or to just take a sketchbook to a mall, draw people, draw architectural stuff, you know, especially for comics, you have to be able to draw so many different things accurately. Oh, yeah. To make it believable, you have to be able to draw, you know, an interior space, foliage. You have to draw animals, people, vehicles, you know, whether or not they're real and exist on the planet Earth. It's a, it's kind of a, it's kind of a crazy field. And the, and the artists who do comics, man, I think are some of the most skilled. Uh, you, you'll see beautiful paintings and renderings and CG work and con- concept art's kind of up there as well. But I feel like comics, being able to tell a story across a series of static images uh, that is, that is, like I said, communicating something to the person who is reading it. They're able to interpret the lines that they're seeing into some meaningful narrative. And it's, it's just like a crazy skill, uh, the people who do it well. I totally <laughs> agree. Totally agree. That's the other thing about comics is like it's such a specific medium for storytelling that when done correctly, it's just like there's nothing like it. It's really, really, really cool. Yeah, man. Jim and I have had. Have you? Have you? Inter- have you done, you're talking to him. He's next. Talk- he's next week. He's next week. All right. Well, you probably will get him on. Get him talking about this because he is so. Oh, I will. So very. He's, yeah, man. He's so very, uh, like, concise and he's he's just really. I mean, Jim's Jim's a really good communicator, especially in his writing. Love that guy. To death. And he, he and I he and I have talked a lot about you know making comics about the medium of comics and he understands it so well. Um, definitely talk to him about it. But he's I feel like he, he feels similar that comics is a unique medium that you can you can bounce around and do stuff in it that doesn't work in other mediums. I so, agree. So uh, recently he and I watched the Into the Spider Verse with my wife. Oh had, yeah. Yeah. So good. she had she hadn't seen it yet. We would both seen it, but we're like we'll watch it with you. And um, the way that they combined that they combined uh, um, animation and comics together yep. in a way that I didn't see. That's, that's kind of the first time I've seen that done really well. Same. And they blended it. And usually you can't blend those two media, media that well. Yeah, it was nuts. <laughs> there, there were so many times in that movie where I was like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. This is crazy. It's just everything going back and forth and the different types of styles in the same frame. Just 
bonkers. Yeah. Bonkers. Yeah, I want to put a caveat there. I don't think I'm one of those people who's like super <laughs> skilled at comics. By the way, I feel like it's uh, as it's someone cheap. who's read all of your comics, I would say you are. Well, uh, thank you, thank you for saying so. But I also just I was more talking about you know like Jerome Pena and and uh, Mike Mignola, you know the people who are established comic artists that like you know. Sure. have shown time and time again that they can make an amazing amazing visual narrative to, to bring the writing you know even more to life <laughs> to be fair they've just been doing it longer so do you, I guess, do you I guess. so having done all the different mediums what is your least favorite one to use <laughs> I, I like that because there's always one guy that's like I just hate oil paintings I just can't oh, say yeah. it. <laughs> I, I used, and I used to love I used to love paint. There's certain aspects of paint. Sorry, I, I didn't mean to get my, I'm looking at my dog is just so weird right now. <laughs> <laughs> she's just upside down. She's a little peeking and she's just upside down and staring at me. <laughs> <laughs> she's like, like little, Hey, what are you <laughs> she's she's, she's also interested in your answer. She she's got a gremlin face. <laughs> <laughs> so, so. Yeah, I I, uh, I very much enjoyed learning to paint in college. I'm not a huge fan of three D. Um, okay. Part of me wants to get into. I can sculpt, you know, whatever sort of. Like I can make a face or something. I can I can sculpt a thing. It would not be an amazing sculpture physically with clay or whatever. I I mean, if you understand how to draw something in three dimensions, generally you can kind of make some a facsimile of it in three D. Sure. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm not the everything I do now is digital. It's definitely my favorite. I love, you know, pencil and ink and you know grayscale marker. Working with color physically on, you know, with marker, I'm not a fan of marker. I'd say that too. Uh, I would say yeah. Saya, Saya, Saya something. I forget her name now. I always I'm like, oh, this person I follow on Instagram, and I can't think of her. And she's done some, she's done some comics herself, and she does this beautiful Copic marker work. Um, I'm, I'll, I'll look her up while I'm talking. But markers, not easy. Um, watercolor, terrible. Hate it. <laughs> There's, there's people who do it so easily, like they just, it's so fluid and so they just make it look like, oh, so you just put one mark here, beautiful, look, it's a whole scene. You're like, I hate you. Yeah, exactly. Um, but, but definitely a favorite is, it's got to be digital because you can, you can replicate any medium, um, and you can undo, and you can add a new layer, you can erase anything, you can add anything, and then you can even like, it's like having a light box too. If you, if you need to to trace something, you just throw it in Photoshop and lighten it and then you can trace it oh yeah it Technology, yeah man. man so did you learn to use the the digital art stuff in college weirdly no i went to flagler college up in st augustine oh, uh, on. got a bachelor in fine arts and paint studio painting and drawing with a minor in business administration fat lot of good that's there you go <laughs> <laughs> but uh <laughs> but i just learned that advertising is evil that's all i learned from that i hear you <laughs> but uh i i was only one who did digital painting then I think I don't know what their programs like now. They had a really amazing traditional art program that, that teaches fundamentals, and they have an amazing painting program. That the instructors there are awesome, um, in their own right and at teaching, and they they take pupils and turn them into excellent painters. Um, but they didn't have a digital art program. I mean, we had this illustration professor who insisted that we do everything uh, with pastel or with, you know, physically like traditional media. And I was like, but can I use my tablet? Cause I had a, a cheaper bamboo tablet back then, just a mouse pad with, you know, graphics tablets, actually a version of them has been around since 1950s. What? It was, I think it's IBM had this thing. You look, you can look it up, look up light pen and it's, it, it's a, the pen really? had a cable attached to it. Oh man, there's a fantastic video of, um, Mark, Mark Cuban. He did uh, stuff with with Star Wars, like original Star Wars. Yeah, it? yeah. And there's a video that's really old and really grainy, uh, you know, crappy quality. But it's about how they constructed that 3D model that is spinning in the presentation before they attack the first Death Star. What? Yeah, it shows how he did it, and they, he took printouts of images, like big flat printout images of the pictures of the, you know, the, how they built the trench. Yeah. The, on on like ping or ping pong tables, so he took pictures of those, and then he took this light pen thing with a little. But you gotta watch the video. Or maybe I'll link it to you. But it's this. They, he had dials, and it was this old CRT crazy uh, wire frame drawing computer screen, and then these dials, and he would spin and tell, you know, tell the program where the cursor was in space, like X Y Z space, and then he would 
put push the pen down on the actual big printout of the picture from you know of the ping pong table this the set and then it would place these these uh shapes you know like the the flow like kind of 3d three-dimensional trapezoids and whatever yeah and he would build he built a bunch of pieces three-dimensional pieces with this crate and i was like what 1977 what the hell is that that's a digital that's a pen i use something like that yeah it's it's way crazier you know it's way better now but (laughs) he's sitting there doing this in 1976 or whenever and then they he took all those pieces constructed a three-dimensional model and then frame by frame took those pieces and just he made all the frames, projected them on this, you know, it's on a TV screen or a computer monitor, and then they set a camera in front of that computer monitor and then did stop motion. They, like, took pictures of every frame consecutively what? and then ran. Yeah, that's how they did that. That whole sequence, which is just like, look here, you see that there's one um, exhaust port. I, I forget the lines. But yeah. that sequence, all of that took that much work. Just That is nuts. Yeah, that's that's <laughs> why... That's why ILM is what it is, man. <laughs> yeah, for real. <laughs> that visionary is the perfect word to describe yeah. George Lucas. Max, maximum effort, man. <laughs> Good Lord. Yeah. So I've been a fan <laughs> of your work for a long time. I'm just going to come out and say it. And oh, one thing that I really enjoy about you is, like, I- I've run into a lot of people that, like, artist takes on, like, this next tier level when you show, like, the facets that you can do. Because I mm. feel like a lot of people, they'll find something that they're good at and they'll do just that. And they get really, really, really good at it. And mm-hmm. with your portfolio, you've got like you've got your comics, <sighs> which are already I'm a massive fan of. But then you've got like this dolphin samurai thing going on, which is amazing. Yeah. You've got yeah. caricatures. Uh that fox thing that you did was oh, yeah. crazy cool. Like and they're all so different. You wouldn't think they're from the same person. No, no. that has that is actually um thanks, by the way. <laughs> for all the compliments. Dude dude but i i have a question being mm-hmm. that you do caricature which is such mm-hmm. a specific style what is mm-hmm. the, what is the key to that well caricature was like boot camp for me um really? there's a lot of, like you were saying people get stuck doing one thing i used to work at universal studios orlando oh, and, sweet. I, and i worked at before that because <laughs> i got in some trouble i wasn't allowed to work at universal for a while <laughs> Um, I worked at Disney instead <laughs> at, Animal <laughs> Kingdom. at Animal Kingdom. All the caricature companies are third party. They're not um, affiliated directly with the parks. Mm-hmm. But so I worked for this lady, had a company, and I sat out at Animal Kingdom wearing those goofy outfits. Um, and I started learning to draw caricatures. And that was like pretty fresh after college. I was a server for a while and then that. And then you you just start learning how to be more confident because we're using marker. You just go straight down with marker. You can do like a real light kind of pencil shape of, of a head. Uh-huh. But character is a very specific art, and I'm glad you understand that because there's about like 500 people in the whole world that are really good at caricature that – and also probably about a thousand total that care <laughs> like, <laughs> because there's there's a there's an international caricature convention that happens I think every year moves a little, moves around yeah and these guys they're amazing like they'll draw five lines like look up Al Hirschfeld Hirschfield um, H I R C S C H I think um, uh-huh. if you look him up you will be like oh I know who that is and it's like if you count the number of lines it's like five lines. And caricature what? is a really weird art because it's not so much, and that's I kind of pushed what pushed me back into comics, really, because caricature is not just drawing a funny head. Caricature is taking something that your brain does automatically. Uh, like if you were to think of your mom or your grandma or your friend, your brain is like, oh, and it just like has this imprint because we're humans that have evolved to be social creatures and need to remember each other individually. We have this imprint that's a really distilled down essence of what we conceive to be that person. Like if you think of Steve Buscemi, you think eyes, right? Right, right, right. What is always emphasized on his caricatures. So oh. so your brain your brain does this automatically, but people who are really skilled at character, and it's it's hard, man. It's really hard to do it right. And I bet. sometimes sometimes it's it's really esoteric and like only caricature artists know when it's a good caricature or because someone else is like what the hell is that uh, <laughs> sure but, like that's a monster you didn't draw it you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's but, a, that's offensive <laughs> yeah yeah you'd be surprised how many people are just don't pay for their character like i don't want that i'm like did you see what we did to jay-z's face like you thought <laughs> we were, you thought we were gonna be nice to you <laughs> But, my uh, nose isn't that big. I I know that's the all right. <laughs> that's I get the it. point. 
Yeah, you, you take that person, that essence of that person, and you distill it out, and you figure out the way it's it's about, like it teaches you. Like I said, it's like boot camp because I'm sitting there, and I, one, I learned how to use an airbrush, which is something that not a lot of people do anymore. Um, to to color these drawings with pencil, and you learn how not. It's the great thing about comics, dude. It's not about the detail. There are guys who go really crazy in detail. Like Aaron Conley's work is f- fantastic. You know, Saber Two Swordsman, and yeah. I forget what he's up to. There's just so much line, and it's like it's kind of a lot to look at, but it's glorious. You know, there's just so much detail, um, and there's there's guys that do that. But I've always been a fan of the people who have economy of line. Like you, it's not what you put down; it's what you can take away. It's not like how much detail you can add, but how much you can leave out and Ooh, still have it. Point. And still have it be representative. You know, that's the the essence of like graphic design or or cartooning is really difficult because I can put it this way: if you look at you know i was saying about how we recognize faces but if you look at an electrical outlet or the front of a car like you'll anthropomorphize it right 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 well if i showed you three circles that were joined kind of like venn diagrams all colored solid black what would you think that's mickey mouse yeah you're right right? and that's kind of logo and branding but mickey mouse himself if you see a cartoon you know that's mickey mouse he's a mouse he's got a tail if you've ever looked at a picture of an actual mouse next to mickey mouse very different right but taking advantage of the human mind's ability to abstract you know the visual image like the the pictures that we see you know your eyeball takes in all this information and our brain is an amazing pattern recognizing machine and it takes all that distills it down it's like that's a fence that's a tree that's a banana these are things i'm looking at in my house um (laughs) but but that's what that's what caricature helped with you know you like i said you just sit there all day and draw people and then you weren't making any sales if nobody sat down because it was a commission-based job sure. so you're like screw it sitting here for eight hours anyway what may as well draw so i just drew and you you draw more caricature and it forces your brain to like flex a muscle you didn't know was there and J- jim can tell you too when we first started doing comics all my people had really big heads <laughs> disproportionate <laughs> to their body because it was too hard to break the habit sure it's got it's got better but it makes you fast because the faster you draw, the more uh, the more money you make. You right, know? the more you can Cause, do. Yeah, because you draw some group of four kids and their parents, and then they scoot off, and the guy next to you is still drawing. You get the next person in line, and that's more commission for you. Sure. So it was all boot camp, and then it, and it flexed that muscle I was talking about, your ability to distill the all of the visual information you're taking in or you want to convey down to the absolute bare minimum necessary to convey that form that motion um, right it was so yeah caricature was cool it's actually running i've run into a problem a lot sorry i talk a lot dude i had a lot of espresso today <laughs> <laughs> no, that's the whole point of the show <laughs> yeah. so i um this is fascinating I, yeah it's a if you really get down into the nitty-gritty of of what comics is or what cartooning is it's not so like you know the guys who draw teen titans go you know and oh, yeah. they get they get trashed on for it, and it's just like, but it's amazing work and the skill involved to take those characters and breathe life into them. You know, flat shapes are yeah. alive because someone decided to to exercise this talent, this skill. They they developed it into a point where they could make the things that they wanted to create. Um, but it, I've actually run into a lot of uh, problems portfolio wise because, like you said, oh, this thing is very different from that. I. My brother says he can tell what my style is. He's a graphic designer. He lives in, in England, but he's like, I know what your style is. I can tell when it's your work. And I'm like, really? Because I, I can't. Really? I can't. <laughs> I said, oh, that's, yeah, yeah. that's brothers, though, isn't it? <laughs> I guess, yeah. I mean, I know what his stuff looks like, too. We, we've known each other a while. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've known him almost his whole life, I swear. There you go. But, <laughs> but uh, so when when I look at my body of work, too, I just try new crap. I get I get bored and of doing one thing one way. Um like you said, somebody will get stuck, and I knew a lot of guys doing caricature where they were, you know, they were really nice people. They were good artists, but they were good caricature artists, and all they would really do is draw caricature. And they got better and better at rendering, you know, faces and stuff. But the second they start drawing below the shoulders, it's just like clear, Tiny clearly, <laughs> yeah, it's just clear that it's it's amateur because they don't, they haven't exercised. Like they're, that's all they've worked on, you know. And if if you only, you know, if you just if you just do curls on one arm, like of 40, 60, 70, 80 pounds, and you leave the other one, like, it's the other arm muscle doesn't go anywhere. Right, know? right. And so then you, you got have... explaining to do. <laughs> yeah, like, <laughs> what's up with that, buddy? <laughs> How'd you... I swear I just woke up this one arm. <laughs> but yeah, it's, uh, so you have, you have to try new things and draw new things. 
but it also kind of gets in my way uh, when I'm, people are like, so we want to hire you to do this, but what, what do you actually do? <laughs> what does your sure. stuff really look like? Because it's tough. Yeah, I mean, I've, I've been doing Disney kids books lately. Uh, recently I got to actually do some designs for a company that prints things for read pop, which what? owns. Yeah, man. So they own, it. they own, it was, it was a pretty cool connection to make. They own read pop owns a, uh, ECC, C2E2, NYCC, um, and they just purchased a company called MCN. Yep. I don't know if you've heard of it. Yeah, so London. they now, yep, so they merged, and they, those are one big company now, oh. and they were looking for designs for the official merchandise, a local company here in Orlando called Enemy Inc. Um, that does, they did a lot of band merch and stuff for, for a long time when they first started. Right uh, they do stay up amazing screen printing like they're really really fantastic guys to the people that own it all the people that work there um but it's a local screen printing shop that just they've gotten a lot more work recently so he's like hey i need stuff for uh marvel star wars like we need this stuff because we're doing the they are printing the official merch some of the official merchandise like what? the stuff that says eccc so if you see anybody wearing a t-shirt that has um captain marvel on it from ecc uh or from emerald city it's, that was my Captain Marvel, so I got to draw some cool things. It doesn't have my name on it, obviously. Cause, sure, you know, they just, that's still but, really cool. It is, man. It's pretty cool. So I'm, I'm happy to be doing some actual official, technically official Marvel and Lucasfilm yeah. stuff. Making moves. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes, man. Man, we'll so, see so had you done comics before uh, a Star Wars comic? Like I said, Jim and I had tried to make comics, and right. I said try because <laughs> because we would we'd get through a few. I'd get through a few. It was almost always me because he'd have a whole script written, right? And, then, and I I'd take I take full blame because he'd have a full script written, he'd give it to me, and I would thumbnail some of it out, and then I would start doing the pages. But then I would just you know, I was like twenty three or something when I met him, so I'd just go drink. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> like, go go draw it at at work at you know, caricatures at Universal, and the last thing you want to do when you've been drawing all day is draw more. Yeah, I hear but, you. But you have to, you know, that's what you got to do. So uh, he might tell you the same story, but we saw Rogue One together, and he was like, so I got this idea. It hit him while he was watching it. Both of us love the side stories, the, you know, the people. Oh, yeah. yeah, the side, the, the people who you don't see. Um, I haven't watched Rebels yet. I'm terrible. Uh, not all of it. It's pretty great. Thinking? What's the what's the one is Rebels the one with the racers? No, uh, that's Resistance. Resistance, thank you. Yeah, no, <laughs> that's, Rebels. That's I watched. New. Okay, it's okay. You Re haven't seen it. <laughs> it is. Yeah, Rebels. I've watched like the first two seasons of, so I have now I need to catch up. But Resistance, I haven't watched, and that I, I heard from you know, Jim and others that it's like that's what it is. It's these guys that are racers. They're not the main heroes, yep. and that's that's kind of the people that I've always sort of been you know thought about. Like, well, what's what's that guy do? You know, what is a what is a painter in the Star Wars universe do? What is a <laughs> what about what about the restaurant owners and you know not not yeah. <laughs> not the black sun or the you know the the rebellion or the empire or the resistance or the first order like the main characters of there no what is what is the guy who's just like damn why am i on this giant ship right now oh right because i was forced into it but like what's their backstory you know yeah what is what is the mundane in the star wars universe look like for sure because shoot we have reality tv here in our that's planet. true and that's all just crap, mundane crap, and people are really into it. Not saying that what we're making is crap, but there is some. There's beauty in the smaller stories. Is all I'm saying. I agree. And and so Jim had this idea with two tubes, and he's he's still kind of a main character, but it was like a side character, and and we actually made made it, and that was the break moment. I think that was when we broke out, because then it was like once we made the second one too, um, there was some bad drawing there of <laughs> of. of of uh, Mon Mothma, I will cop to that. But if you say each, so, <laughs> each one, each one that we made, just meant that we were going to make more. Like because it's like, well, we can't stop the train. You know, now it's now it's moving. Sure. Um, there were some that were came in late. There were some that were sort of uh, very late nights. Uh, hollow shells. I was up until five a.m. Um, you know, really all, all nighter. Yeah, we really, we really did it. <laughs> but but that's what really made us make. I hadn't made comics because it would just stop. Like the work would stop after a few pages and there would be no color. But with this, after a few years of, of getting better at drawing and better at digital, like the process of digitally making comics, cause there's a, there's a process. Everybody's is slightly different, but they are, there are similarities. Sure. Different software, but generally it's kind of like the same, you know, outline of, of step one, step two. 
And so I knew, un- understood that better. And it just, it just happened. Like we finally, it finally happened. And he would, man, he, he obsesses over his writing, which is why it's so good. He'll rewrite and rewrite the same, you know, dialogue bubble <laughs> sure. until it's perfect. And then even then it's not perfect and we still have to put it out. So it was kind of, <laughs> it, was, it was kind of also giving ourselves a deadline that really helped us get it out too, because Jim and I both in our own ways are perfectionists and, you know, you don't want to put something out there if it's going to get, we, we've, I think we both were like, oh, this is, this is going to be, this is one where we're going to get trashed by everybody. They're going <laughs> to, they're going to jump all over it and say, how dare you make some such filth, you know, crawl back in your hole and die. <laughs> but it didn't, you're it not never a star happened. war. <laughs> yeah, you're not a star war. Well, and it never happened. We've, we gotten pretty overwhelmingly positive responses and people translating our stuff into various languages and that's pretty so cool. cool. It's very cool, man. Especially having, for Jim to see his words in Russian. I bet that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, having read them all, I can say it's a. Uh, there isn't a weak one, which is very impressive. Because most series, even like big time, uh, big time storylines now with comics, there's always like one or two where you're like, uh, you know, I could have done without that one. Well, mm. is. This is an anime filler of an issue. Nah, uh, the, the fan service. There's always the beach episode. <laughs> that's right. Exactly. Exactly. There's always one going to get ice cream. Uh, yeah. But. There's not a single weak one uh, in your whole series, and I'm curious. Like you said, you said there's a process. What exactly is the process of making a comic, and which one took the longest? Oh, uh, the like for the longest to make was probably um, simply because it had the most pages. Was uh, the Corellian run? Ooh, good, one. One. good one. Thanks for saying they're all strong too. We very, I'm sure Jim appreciates it as well. <laughs> but the, the process is is pretty much the same as it always. Comics, it used to be there was extra steps because they didn't have scanners, digital scanners. They didn't have the Photoshop. You know, back in the you know 40s, 50s, 60s, um, it was all still very much a chemical manual process sure. to re- to reproduce them and to color them. But generally, the way it goes now is Jim writes the script, gives me the script, I have a template in Photoshop that I scribble out pencil sketches of generally what the flow of the action, the paneling, uh, placement of characters. And then I, I really have been trying, especially as it wore on, like to place the dialogue bubbles and give them sort of an appropriate size, because that's something I really oh, had trouble with crazy. is making sure, making sure his writing will fit the way that I've laid the panel out. Sure. I, I think some artists are amazing at Goran Parlov is one of my favorite artists. And he, I think, at least in um, what's it called, Starlight, which came out as Mark Millar wrote it. Uh, uh-huh. It was probably you know what I'm talking about. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So if you look, he actually I feel like marked out the bubbles um, and gave them enough room. But some of them, it was like Millar didn't actually have enough writing to go fill that bubble, it, but he just sort of made it a generic size. Like there was some in there where he'd he'd crop it over the gutter, um, and it looks like he hand drew it in with with a, a pen. Really like here's cool. where the here's where the bubble goes, you know, yeah. and 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 it's it used to be you had to plot out that very well because there was a letterer, you know, the process was penciler uh, would get it, send it off to the letterer, and the letterer would hand letter everything and draw in the bubbles. He would ink in the writing, ink in the bubbles, and then it would go to the inker who would ink around the bubbles. And I've seen, um, I'm actually going to be doing a, a talk at a comic uh, exhibit at the. Daytona Beach Museum of Con- or Arts and Sciences. Oh, right on. Yeah, and the, the lady uh, approached me and said, hey, would you do this talk? And they have a bunch of, like, I think Ramita's work and stuff there. Sweet. And if you, if you go and look, it's so cool to look at, at comic pages from from that era because there will be whiteout, there will be, like, bubbles that they had to cut, cut paste, you know, over. Yeah. <laughs> Like they had to mishmash this page together before they could re- reproduce it to fix errors. Um, anyway, so I do the thumbnails and then I send them to Jim. He approves them and then you know tells me if he thinks there might be something wrong. And then I pencil them out. And then generally I try to show them, show him sort of as I'm working on stuff. So in case he catches any glaring errors, like I don't have to go back and fix an hour's worth of work. Um, but then pencils and then you ink it and then you color it by doing coloring is its own process. It's like you generally fill in all of the, like a coloring book, you fill in all the areas that you need to with flat, just flat, solid pixels, just one color of each area. You know, it doesn't even have to, doesn't have to be the local color, which is, 
you know, leaves are green, but there are so many varying shades of green that can exist on one plant. You know what I mean? Sure. That's, that's the local color. The local color of something is like the actual color that it is. And then there's a shadow and a tint, you know? So you just pick a color, plop it down, and then you go through and select all those pieces individually and you can shadow them, color over them. And then that generally ends up being your finished product. Sometimes you have to like fade out some lines to drop the background back. Oh, and then you have to go through and I hand I've start I've hand drawn all of the bubbles in our comics since um, the Leia issue. Really? Since Hope, since Hope, yeah. I tried it out on that issue and I really liked the look. It was because I had just reread Starlight by Goran Parlov and I was like, sure. he, hand draws, he hand draws all these bubbles and they look awesome. So I tried it and because I was doing it in Adobe Illustrator, which is very um, you can make them look hand drawn ish, but it's always very clean and I like. It's a very slight stylistic difference, but I liked hand drawing the bubbles. So, yeah. So there's that. But that's how it goes. It goes like thumbnail, pencil, uh, ink, color, letter. Sometimes I'll letter before I finish everything just to make sure it works. And then that's the finished image. It's kind of the, like I said, no matter who you're talking to comic wise, that's generally the process. There's like variations and slight differences in how they go about doing that. Some guys will pencil their comic and then print it on a large format printer. They'll print their, they'll do all their pencils digitally so they don't have to erase anything, you know, on a on a physical piece of paper. And then they'll print it out really light, and then they get that nice actual hand drawn look to their inks because they ink it physically, um, ah. and then they then they rescan it in to the computer, and then they, you know, because. Some comic artists do all of it by hand. They'll pencil by hand, and then someone will ink it by hand, and then the colorist has to take the scanned image, clean it up, and then color it. So if you do it from start to finish digitally, it's easier to work with because it's already a digital format, you know? Sure. But, but sometimes people prefer to ink it by hand or, you know, do part of the process by hand so that they still get that nice, you know, sort of, it's not perfect. You know, they get that imperfect look because it's, it's done with actual ink or whatever. Sure. They get that human look. Yeah, what, it looks like a real human. <laughs> man, what blows my mind is like you're talking about all these jobs and that's you. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I did all of it. That's, that's insane. <laughs> you're like, we got this guy that does this, this guy that does this, this guy that does this. You're like, oh, no, it's it's Jim writes it and then, and then I make it. <laughs> that's yeah, insane. We've, yeah, we had some, we had some uh, arguments about that over time, but like he, he has to write them, you know? Sure. Um, Without a story, what are you going to do? And there's no one else. It's like I said, we're perfectionists in our own way. And it's my own kind of neurotic thing that I don't work well artistically with other people. I have, I have done very few collaborative pieces. Um, and most notably they would be with my wife. We paint murals together. We're actually painting. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, I mean, it's really, it is fun, but she, she gets, she'll get mad at me because I start to get, like, <laughs> I get the control freak, you know? I'm like, no, you need to do this this line this way. And she's like, or you could just let me paint it. <laughs> oh, I'm going to paint it. <laughs> you have the line. She goes, Alex, your caricature is showing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, no, I realized that I've never really done a collaborative artistic piece with people because I just, I feel like I, that's my, it's one of my flaws. And so, yeah, it's almost like I wouldn't trust someone else. My brother did letter one of our comics. Uh, oh. He did because he – I kind of showed him – I gave him a tutorial on how you would he's, – he's a graphic designer. He knows how to use the Adobe Creative Suite. Yeah. So I gave him kind of a tutorial on how I had approached our lettering, and he lettered uh, – I think it was uh, – um, no – no uh, not no emotion. Uh, yeah. Wait. What was the one – what was the one in the uh, prequel era or the old Republic era prequel era with, <laughs> I can't remember our own damn comic. Hold on. <laughs> you've had, a, you've had a few in the prequel era. Yeah. Yeah. That's, it was the one with, um, the Jim's original, the characters he created. Oh, that's a uh, wild space. No, uh, no, no, no. That was, that was actually, that was, um, uh, galactic civil war era. Oh, right, 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 right. When you said original characters, I was like, Oh, it's gotta be those guys. Yeah, no, it was, uh, my I... Tor and, um, yeah. That one. Damn it. Well, I'm just going to grab I'm going to pull it up because I just can't. I'm trying to remember which one is no emotion. No, it's not. That's that's it is no emotion. Okay, cool. Cuz he had written he wrote another script featuring these characters. Um uh -huh. we just we just never made it. It's kind of sad, but maybe one day. Yeah, that's my felt tour and um yeah, I'm pretty sure he lettered this. I might I might have that wrong cuz they all blur together like the process of making them. Um Dude. 
Yeah, but Nick Ardum Artemay, that's so yeah, Maya Filtor and Nick Artemay, those are the those are the two characters Jim created and they are kind of like the it's like a love story, you know, across and she has to she has to um, battle with her her duty as a Jedi versus her obvious you know, un, unavoidable emotion and, and yes, and yes, the one where she's talking to the council and they're yes. like, how'd it go? And it's like, oh, here's this guy that I met, and then had, she had to leave at the end to be like, oh yeah, gotta go do my job as a Jedi. Yeah, yeah and yes. Yoda's like, yeah, Yoda's like, I knew, I know you love her, but you know, you gotta, you got some choices to make, lady. <laughs> yeah, oh, that was one. Of, that was one of my favorites to make because I got to draw friggin' Yoda, and he's the absolute best. Yeah. Oh, dude, with you there. So actually, on that, when you so you drawn a lot of star wars comics now you've done mm. ships you've done aliens you've done planets do you have a favorite what of characters or? out of those like some people really like ships it's usually one of the three some people like that some people really like characters i uh yeah i'm the ships yeah <laughs> yeah i i always say that my, i mean with all the star wars books i read before i read a couple of the i mean i read like i jedi um, oh nice but the only reason I really liked wanted to read that one is because of the X Wing series. That's that was my jam. Yeah. I, I would just I would fast forward the VHS of Return to watch the second Death Star. I would I would watch the beginning of Empire to get the Battle of Hoth. I would watch the end of A New Hope. You know, I would just fast forward to the parts with the ships. <laughs> that's what I that's what I wanted was the space battles. You know, I was because I was obsessed with Top Gun as a kid and uh, I just love jets. You know, I loved flying things. I wanted to be a pilot for a while. <laughs> sure. What's um, your What's your favorite ship? Uh, come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> Choose Seriously, between though, your babies. <laughs> I love the I love the A wing. Same. Uh, yeah. That's my favorite of the original fighters. <laughs> can't fly it for crap in Battlefront Two. No, but... <laughs> I can't fly anything in Battlefront Two. <laughs> <laughs> I try so hard, and it's just like I don't know if they're all hackers. <laughs> <I don't know. laughs> yeah. But it seems like it seems like it just get blasted. I, I don't play it enough to be very good at it. But those the guys who play the the people who play um, Starfighter Assault are just why it's like why are you so good, man? I agree. Can't you just can't you just let me shoot down the computers? <laughs> oh yeah. I'm just gonna shoot down the computer guys. Not even you. You can shoot me. Just wait till I shoot a computer person. Exactly. Down. Let me get one, please. <laughs> come on. <laughs> I understand yeah. your spatial awareness is better than mine, but come on. <laughs> right. Try a try for kicks. Just just turn on. Go into cockpit view. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And then try try that out on for sizes. Yeah. It's, it's really hard. Let's just add tunnel vision to this. But I did, difficult thing. <laughs> I think that's one of that's one of the reasons why I love uh, Wild Space a lot. I mean, I like the Poe Dameron one that we did a lot because there was that's so many one. ships I got to draw. Yeah. Uh, but but the one I also really liked. I love all of them in their own way. You know, because it was really fun drawing the characters too. I'm not gonna lie. I do like drawing the ships a lot. Uh, mm -hmm. But you know, the people are cool too. I, obviously um but i really liked wild space because it was kind of a combination of those i got to do it was the first one where jim's like you're gonna love this one man it's just ships and i was like i love you yeah. but <laughs> but you. uh but then he created these two awesome you know characters of of oh, his yeah. own of his own making um yeah, rad and mag yeah rad, i love the rad Radan. but yeah they're and so they we got to make some really cool ones and like every every comic presented kind of its own challenges several of them i had i built out entire like the <laughs> though looking back on it it wasn't it's it's not how i would have preferred it to look but uh the um pa the madman with the handmaidens oh yeah yeah that one um that i built an entire city that that entire scene like i built the all of that in uh google sketchup what it, yeah, like built it in 3D so that I could have the scene and just trace over it, so I didn't have to like do a a perspective grid for every panel. And yeah, I'm sure I'm sure some comic guys would, you know, be like cheater or whatever. <laughs> but it's like whatever. Hey, it works for the for the layman such as myself. Yeah, man, it's it's work smarter, not harder, man. I hear that, man. So do you do you have a you like them all? Is Wild Space the one that's like it just sticks just a, a hair above the rest because of the originality of all of it? Um, I mean, every, I, like I, I can't ask you what your favorite is. No, I <laughs> yeah, that one for sure. Uh, no emotion with. Um, I mean, the characters that Jim created because they're kind of like our creation because he 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 made them and then I drew them, you know. Right, but they're, right. They they didn't exist in the Star Wars universe before because it was really fun to draw. You know the the Sith, the Dark Lords. Um, oh, the that Sith was one. nuts. The Kotor yeah. nods. 
Yeah, I had to I had to find I had to go and find imagery of all the known Sith lords from like Jim gave me a laundry list like put these people in here. Yeah, <laughs> and I had to go and find their them all. And yeah, so you know, and then Sabine, we drew her. Uh, these are all people that exist. I got to draw a young baby Luke, yeah, you know, you but but the characters that we made were were definitely cool. And then, um, but I still have to say the the hope hope was the. Every time I read, like I would reread and reread the script because I had the bubble. I had to do the lettering and all that, and I kept rereading to make sure I had missed something. You have to like check and check again, check the script. But every time I got to that last panel, it was just for probably the first fifteen times I read the last couple panels, and that's even in the script. I was just like got all misty. Yeah. Like, Damn it, Jim. <laughs> <laughs> every time, dude. I really liked doing the. Uh, um, you know, hollow shells was fun because I finally kind of fell into it. I feel like it looked it looked good from the arts. All this is coming from an art standpoint. I can't speak to the struggles that Jim had oh, besides yeah. what he told me. That's why he's on next. <laughs> yes, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely get his side of the story because I'm talking from from my my point of view. Sure, but but I liked um, the kind of he he like he told me later echoes. He was like it kind of felt like a D and D. Um, session, you know, because they, they go into a dungeon, there's monsters, you know, yeah. it's a mission, and there's like, you got the guy with the battle axe, you got the two, the communications guy, but that one was really fun as well, because it was, it kept, I kept thinking of the thing, because of the snow, oh, yeah. setting the snow. <laughs> I like, was trying to evoke that sort of horror, you know. Oh, it worked. You got a Wookiee with a battle axe, which is pretty cool, fighting Wampus. <sighs> And seriously, man, I, he, was, he was like, you need to draw a, a Wookiee with a vibro axe. And I'm like, Jim, Jim, that's great. That is, thank you, Jim. <laughs> that's great. You're like, I, I can do that. I can do that. <laughs> I know. Every time he, he put these things in front of me, I'm just like, well, that's awesome. I'll draw that. <laughs> Check. I, I'm, I'm not regretting doing this every day. <laughs> yeah, man. It's, Dude. It's, been a, it's been an adventure. It's sad that it's ending, but we kind of, my wife and I are, going to be moving states this uh summer and then um we're like Jim, jim's got other projects he's writing and sure. until until hopefully i find a job in programming or tech or something you know and then, and then like settle into that see see how the flow of things goes with that because i'll still be doing artwork you know right uh, obviously they, you can work remotely pretty much all the jobs i'm doing like i said disney kids books and the, the designs that i've been doing lately I, I just email them in, you know, I don't have to be in a place. I can just get on a Skype call and it's kind of cool. Um, yeah, but beauty of the but, internet. Yeah. So, but so I'm not going to stop making art or something. It's just, we have to put Star Wars comic on hold and sure. <laughs> Moving takes a lot. It does. I, will, I, will... I also, I, I really enjoyed, like we talked about how, um, you have like a wide range of, of your artistic styles and that comes through several times in the Star Wars comic. Like I, the one that's on the top of my head was, um, uh, I think it was called Mad About Me, the the mm -hmm. Cantina band. Yeah. Because the art style was so different from like Two Tubes, mm -hmm. and just like I, I also really enjoy like, from an actor's standpoint, I really enjoy scenes that have no dialogue, because I Jim. feel like they're so much harder to do. Yeah, Jim and, wrote. Man. He, I mean, he was his descriptions of Jim wrote two silent comics. He's he's yeah, just crazy, so, crazy talented. So good. That, like that's the perfect mesh as well. Like you guys just work very very well together. Um, as a fan, thank you. But, like, <laughs> You're welcome. I think of that one. Like and you know scenes in movies as well. Like they're written scenes, but there's no dialogue. So it's like you have to do some extra lifting on the other end of it from the actor or the artist's perspective. Uh, like Mad About Me or the uh, the annual one you guys did. Um, mm -hmm. The Last Jedi. Yes, dude. It's like there's no words going on, but there's so much that you're conveying. And it's like, I don't know. It's like you're meeting the reader halfway, which makes it even that much more impactful because you're like, I have to draw my conclusion from what I'm looking at. But then mm -hmm. you guys did that. Yeah, they, yeah, it was Jim, Jim's. Uh, I've always loved how descriptive he's. So descriptive in his panels. You know, he writes. He writes it like a novelist would write it. You know, he doesn't spare any any descriptions or or any, um, you know, d descriptive language. It, and I'm talking like actual kind of not just standard expo. Uh, what do you call it? The like prose or just the. Um, Ugh, what's the word when you're just like here's the here's what's happening exposition 
Thank you. Yeah, it's, it's not just exposition. There's like metaphor and and poetic language in the descriptions he writes of what's happening in the panel. You know, like he'll have evocative language. And so it's not just me drawing it. He also gives like a really good description um, of the feeling and stuff you're getting from this panel before I go draw it. So, so it's cool. not. Yeah, he. Um, those those so those ones were a lot him too. Like you don't get to see his writing. I think he posted at least his script from Mad About Me. I hope because he like you read it and it's like you know yeah I drew it, but he told the story. You know what I mean? Sure, it's that perfect symbiotic relationship yeah. there to bring it. And I I cannot have you on and not talk about my my favorite mm -hmm. uh, is The Apprentice. Really? Because <laughs> dude, uh, Qui Gon's kind of my thing. Yeah, like that's that's my dude. And um, obsessed is a is a tame word um, for my love of this character. So when I heard that you guys were doing a, a Qui-Gon issue, I was like, oh, my God, I'm just running around. And well, then I Jim, read it. Jim loves Qui-Gon, too. So me and Jim are going to be very good friends soon. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> he, he's my favorite person to follow on Twitter. <laughs> we have the exact same kind of humor. But the 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 apprentice, I'm wondering when you're when you're drawing like a young Qui-Gon Jinn. What made you go with that sort of like hairstyle and facial hairstyle, like that that look? Uh, well, that was once again it was Jim's description of Qui Gon. He was like, really? "Yeah, Qui Gon." But yeah, he's like, "We see Qui Gon Jin. He's a few years younger." Like, here, I'm gonna pull up the script and you can hear it. Oh, <laughs> behind <he's>... the scenes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he he described him, and and then I went and looked up pictures of uh, of. Uh, Liam Neeson, like, but as a young guy, and dude, he was cut. <laughs> we I all, know. Were, we were all so skinny, you know, back yeah. in the we were, <laughs> way but, back uh, when. <laughs> way back when, yeah. So he uh, he described Liam Neeson as uh, uh, the face of Qui Gon Jinn younger than in the Phantom Menace. His hair is shorter, still long, but in a top knot. Ooh. That was that was his description of him, and I was like, all right. And I just went and looked up the young Liam Neeson, shortened his hair, put it in the top knot, and then I kind of didn't give him quite his full of a goatee because he has more of a beard in the yeah. Phantom Menace, I think. So, and it didn't honestly his the length of his hair. If you really look at it, I mean, like I said, I'm a perfectionist, and never. <laughs> I'm literally the my only critic. I feel like that that is that nitpicky, the worst one. But that's uh, usually how it goes. <laughs> You've seen so, how the sausage is made. Yes. <laughs> so I'm. Um, <laughs> His his hair changes length sort of slightly from panel to panel. I don't believe you. But but overall it was it was pretty successful I feel like and there was some that I wish that I had more time to spend on it but it was very late in coming because there was just a lot going on and I didn't manage to finish it on time it came out like what a month and a half or more late. Uh, it was worth it. It was worth it. So who's your favorite Star Wars character? Uh definitely Yoda. I mean yeah. I've actually I've actually kind of become a fan of. Um, Poe Dameron. Oh, Poe's great. Like the last, the, um, more like the Force Awakens Poe Dameron because I feel like the characters kind of got thrown around characterization wise. And I don't want to get into a conversation about that. But <laughs> of course. <laughs> I'm just saying, like, The Last Jedi was, was uh, there, it seemed kind of some of the characters were like not themselves at, in every scene. You know what I mean? They, mm -hmm. I didn't quite get it. I get it. He's a hothead, but it's like, why is he that much of a hothead? Like, yeah. why, does, why does he have? Why does he have to be that? You know, uh, there's a lot of problems. We found out he doesn't handle things well when his friends are like laid up in the hospital. Straight up, yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. a breaking but, point. <laughs> but yeah, once again, he's a pilot, so you know. <laughs> it's true. It's true. <laughs> they yeah. they have their they have their hangups. <laughs> yeah. So I'm always I'm always a fan of the pilot, but Yoda for sure. I mean, he's the the like. I'm with you. Yoda's my number the, two. Who's your number one? Qui Gon. <laughs> oh right, 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 right. Yeah, well, Qui Gon's amazing too. I mean, I loved that Jim made it. So he's like, oh, he's on a sabbatical. Right. And it's like, of course he's good. He's he's Qui. He's like the most un. He's the he's the he's the rebel Jedi. He's like the one that's that's not gonna follow the rules. He's, exactly. He's a smart ass. He, <laughs> he's what I call the Jedi who did it right. When yeah. everyone else kind of got into their steps of like, oh, this is just how things are because of tradition's sake. He's like, no, nah, there's more to this. You're just not paying attention yeah. anymore. Yeah, it was, and it was a really good um, look into his character, like Jim's explanation. It was. It was. Right? That's another thing I love about what you guys have done is it's everything that you've done with characters that are known as well all felt in character with it. So like you did such a good job, both of you. Oh, that's well, that's all Jim, man. Dude. I mean, he 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 wrote the characters. Like that's I just I I drew them, but he that drew them faithfully. He, Yes. <laughs> that, uh, another thing I have to say is the the episode the episode uh, the issue allies with Plo Koon. Mm -hmm. You had those alien species, 
that were called the the Brescians, I think. Yeah, yeah the okay. Brescians. Those are my favorite aliens you guys have ever created. <laughs> yeah. They're so cool. I'm aliens are kind of my thing as well. I mm-hmm. really that's like the magic of Star Wars, and they just look so cool. I, I hope but, they uh, I hope they pull, pull them in to <laughs> the actual right. You know, be I, sweet. Hey, you never know because Ala mm-hmm. Sakura came from a comic. And George Lucas was like, I like her. Put her in the movie. <laughs> that's so, awesome. I never, I actually never do that. That's, that's fun. That's right. So you never know. And mm-hmm. they fit. They fit with the blue skin and the beards and the multiple eyes. I'm for it, man. Yeah. So what was the What was the one from um, the, the the people that were – it was actually in – oh, God. I can't even remember the name of the book. But it was the one about uh, – it was before Rogue One. It was about Galen Erso. Um, the Catalyst. Yes, Catalyst. Uh, the, remember the planet that he was on. Um, like working on stuff. Yeah, the one where I, he got uh, the one where he got captured. Yes. Uh, and didn't they didn't they show them at rebels or like some what those creatures or no? Am I just thinking it from the book? But those I feel like that's kind of what I was thinking of. Maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. I can see that. But I wasn't there? That. Maybe it was a uh, maybe it was Clone Wars. It was one where there was creatures that. It was a plan. I think Sabine was in it. Uh, and it's also hazy. I've, I haven't watched that. <laughs> I haven't watched Clone Wars in a while. There is, is there is a. Uh, in Clone Wars, you get to see the Pikes, and then you see one in Solo. That's okay. Like, that's like another crossover between animation and live action. So mm. you just never know. Yeah. You just never well, know. we get the Mandalorian soon. I that's... know. <laughs> the possibilities are endless. It's like, finally, they're giving them their own thing. I know, for real. It's a time great. in the sun. It's going to be great. But uh, can you believe we've been talking for over an hour and 20 minutes? Oh, I just checked, and I was like, wow, that's, what do you know? What yeah. You know? <laughs> that, that's a litmus test for me. I'm like, mm. oh, hey, we've been talking for a while. And every now and then someone's going to be like, oh, yeah, no, I got to go. And I'm like, mm. oh, maybe I won't release this one. But this was really fun, man. Cool. Yeah, I'm glad. You know, um, a good time. Yeah, that's, it's, it's been fun talking to you. Hey, you know, you should uh, – if you like just random conversations, you should, if if you haven't heard it before, Beautiful Anonymous, you ever check out that podcast? Oh, writing that down right now. Yeah, Chris Gethard. Uh, oh, yeah. Not not all of them are easy to listen to, but he literally, random caller, uh, no personally identifying information. He picks up the phone and then they talk about whatever for an hour. And then what? when the time, yeah, when That's the time, what I do. <laughs> yeah, and then when the time is up, the it ends. And yeah, it's Chris Gethard. He's a comedian. Um, but he's been pretty well known for that. And that some of them are really heartfelt and heartwarming. Some are terrible to listen to. You're just like, Oh my, I had no idea somebody could suffer this much. Sometimes yeah. it's literally, it's literally an hour of dad jokes and poop jokes. Like you never know, <laughs> you, you never know what the person's going to want to talk about. My, my wife, um, got me into that. We, we listen to them sometimes, but yeah, it's like an hour of just a random conversation. You might dig it. It's kind of your format too, sort of. Yeah, I Except- definitely dig it. Except you know your your caller. That's true. That's true. I do. I do try to. <laughs> mm-hmm. But dude, yeah, this was really really fun. I uh, hope you've had a good time. And yeah. before I forget, where can people find you online? Uh, my t- Twitter is uh, at alexray1029. Instagram is also at alexray1029. Uh, and then if you want to purchase any prints and stuff of mine, it's alexrayart.com. Yes. And that's a portfolio of my work as well as on there. So. Hit me up. There's even a section for commissions. I'm always open for that. So. Yeah, and we've discussed you have range, so hit them up, peeps. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Brian. Absolutely, and uh, I guess I will talk to you soon. Thanks again. I appreciate your time. Sure, man. I will talk to you soon. All right, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Hello, friends. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of The Interesting Podcast. If you'd like to follow the show, it is at Pod of Interest on Twitter. If you'd like to follow me, I'm at Jedi Brian on all social media sites. Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Jedi Brian everywhere. If you enjoyed this episode, please share it and tell your friends. Let them know we've got some cool stuff going on over here. Speaking of cool stuff, we now have merch. That's right. You asked, I answered. Just search The Interesting Podcast on Tee Public to get some sweet gear. I got all kinds of stuff over there. 
Also, I've made a Patreon. If you'd like to support the show and get access to other exclusive shows, like The Hype Show and the D&D Podcast, and a whole bunch of other cool stuff, uh, you can do that over at patreon.com slash Brian. On that note, special thanks to Chris, Ben, Jim, Daz, Kelly, Daryl, Logan, and Victor. Your support means so, so, so much, and I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. So until next time, be well.